Sending, can you please provide us with the address from where you're teleconferencing from? Sure. 855 East Kilchinji Drive, Boulder Creek, California, 95006. And is, and the, is location the location from where you're teleconferencing from, from, from open to the public, to the public and, and yeah. accessible? accessible? Yes. And have, and you, have post you post the agenda on the outside of the location so where it can be publicly seen? Yes. And if a member of the public would wish to be heard from that location by this uh, board, would they be able to do that? Yes. Okay, thank you. All because she's appearing telephonically, all, call all votes shall be roll call votes. Great, thank you. All, all votes will be roll call votes. Uh, orders of the day, uh, apparently there are none. Looks like we need to waive sunshine on investment items 4D, 4E, 4F, and new business items 6C and 6D. <coughs> Do we have a motion to waive sunshine? So, so moved, moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to take uh, the motion by Trustee Linder and a second by Trustee Chandra. Any discussion, any public comments? Uh, we will have a roll call vote. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Uh, Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. I vote aye as well. <coughs> Sunshine is waived. Um, at this time, we will take public comment on any item that is not otherwise on the agenda, and uh, but which is uh, subject to uh, this board's uh, interest and authority. Uh, speakers will have three minutes to speak. Uh, is there anyone present here or online who wishes to address? There are no comments, okay? Uh, we will proceed then to the consent calendar. I thank Trustee Avasta. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 note for the record that Trustee uh, Avasti has now entered the room and uh, will be with us. Thank you. Um, consent calendar. Do we have a motion to accept the consent calendar? I so move. We have a motion from Trustee Abbott, a second? Second. Second from Trustee Linder. Any discussion, any public comment? We will vote. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And I vote aye as well. It passes. We will now move to uh, the next item, which is closed session. Yep. Let us convene.
recommendation from the Disability Committee was to deny. Chair, before, before we move on, may I please state for the record there's okay. no closed session report y out? Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, so we need a formal vote on uh, to adopt the recommendation of the Disability Committee. Is that correct? I'll move the adoption of our recommendation. Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Linder. Is there a second? I'll second that. We have a second from Trustee Chandra. Is there any further discussion by trustees? Any public comment, either in the room or online? Seeing none, we will vote. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings? We'll come back to you. Uh, Trustee Abbott? Aye. Uh, Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. And I vote aye as well. So the uh, uh, we approve the recommendation of the Disability Committee. Okay, we have voted on the consent calendar. Next is uh, death and survivorship. At this time, we will have a moment of silence for those who have served the pit city and who have passed. Thank you. We're on to item 4A, investments, and we start with an oral update from the CIO, Mr. Polani. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a full agenda, so let's get on it. Uh, but before I do that, since we last met, uh, <laughs> markets, <laughs> it's been a rough time in the markets. Mm -hmm. uh, so Just yeah, a, a bad week. We do have a fair amount of beta in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So as of April 16th, uh, the pension plan was up 5.46% year to date, and healthcare trust was up 5.17%. And as you all know, when I reported last month, it was up 7% or more. So we've had a, a bit of a sell off. Mm -hmm. And those things happen markets go up and markets go down. So. They, absolutely. Uh, uh, which is probably an ex excellent lead into the next item. <laughs> yes. Uh, we are long-term investors, and we will be discussing our long-term strategic asset allocation. And for that, I have Laura. Before I turn it over to Laura, we did extensively discuss this at the IC, and we were going to discuss this at the last board meeting, but we did have a full agenda at the last board meeting, so it was deferred to this month. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Laura will, there was a recommendation from the IC to consider a change and the implications of that change and Laura will discuss that. Okay, great. Is she is on Zoom. She's with us online. Great. Yes. Laura? Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, I have a document here um, as your, let's see. All right, I believe, can everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, so um, at the IC meeting, I was joined by Makita's Director of Research, Frank Benham, who has overseen our capital markets expectation development process for um, decades now. And so, as um, your CIO mentioned, we had an extensive discussion on the capital market expectations. So I know there are two documents attached to your agenda today. I'm going to address the second one. The first one is for your information, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, in the interest of time, I will move ahead to the item that you're considering today rather than all of the backup for that. Um, but I'm happy to, uh, to take questions on our expectations at any time as well. So the second attachment, which I have here, it deals with the recommendation from the investment committee, which was to consider um, potentially moving 2% of assets from investment grade bonds to long-term government bonds. So on page three here, you can see the current policy for your plan on the left. And on the right, you see that 2% investment grade bonds to long-term government bonds. And you can see where that happens um, about two thirds of the way down the slide. You can see investment grade bonds currently have a targeted 8%. We're considering moving it to six today. And long-term government bonds have a targeted 2%. We're considering moving it to four. This is a relatively small change, just moving 2% of assets that you're considering. Um, so you can see that it doesn't have a major impact on um, the outcomes. Um, because we are looking at 20 year long term expectations here. And as your CIO mentioned, this is a long term plan. So even if that would, you know, have some some implications in different short term market environments, we don't expect it to have much of one over the long term. So we would still expect an expected return over 20 years, an average annual expected return 
of about 8.5% per year, even if you make this change relative to your current policy. We show here the Makita standard deviation. As you know, you consider for your decision making the Virus standard deviation. So I did collect that number from them as well. You can see here that the Makita standard deviation or volatility or risk level wouldn't be expected to change, neither would Virus's. So Virus predicted an 11.8% standard deviation for your current policy, and they also um, predict a 11.8% standard deviation if you were to make this change. Um, you can see the probability of achieving the actuarial assumed rate of return over 20 years is still rounding to 74%, but you'd have a slightly better chance given our modeling um, if you do make the change of 2% from investment grade bonds to long-term governments. We like to look at other types of analysis as well beyond just the asset class return and, and volatility predictions because we know those numbers aren't gonna be exactly right since they are forecasts. So here you have a risk analysis just showing that your risk would be very slightly reduced in a worst case scenario environment you'd have a slightly lower probability of experiencing negative returns if you do make this change, um, and a slightly higher probability of achieving your assumed rate of return. Value at risk is essentially exactly the same. There would be a little bit less value at risk in your plan if you make this change. We also like to look at historical negative scenario analyses, and these don't depend on what market, um, what market returns Makita predicts. This is actual index returns for your asset classes in different stress market environments historically. So what we find is that moving 2% to long-term governed bonds would be slightly protect protective during the most negative market scenarios. In general, long-term government bonds are sort of a hedge for major systemic risk, geopolitical issues. They often are the only asset class that performs well in some of those really stressed market environments. If we look at the positive scenarios, it really depends. Um, interest rates really impact how long-term government bonds do. They do very well in rate environments where interest rates are going down. Long-term government bonds often do very poorly when interest rates are going up. So when we saw the COVID recovery um, of interest rates going up, you would expect a slightly lower um, portfolio return if you did have more money in long-term government bonds. As I mentioned, you know rates going up you'd see a worse return for long-term bonds. On the next slide, rates going down, you would see a better return for your portfolio with more long-term bonds. We also like to look at a type of modeling that we've developed called economic regime management. So what we found is that the absolute level of say interest rates doesn't really impact your portfolio as much as whether or not there's a surprise relative to what the market is expecting. And so we look at exposure to different risk factors here and portfolio sensitivity to these things. And what you'd find here is that you'd have slightly less systemic risk or sort of global financial crisis type risk in your portfolio if you make a change of 2% investment grade bonds to long-term government bonds. So with that, I will go back to sort of the, the slide of considering um, whether or not to move that 2% of assets. Um, as I mentioned, Long-term government bonds are a lot more volatile just because of the duration than investment grade bonds. So in short-term market environments, you'd expect more changes, more volatility. But when they're in a long-term portfolio like yours, they can hedge some risk and sort of zig and zag in different ways than the rest of your assets. And overall, that can reduce your risk a little bit. So we do think that this change that was suggested at the investment committee is something worth considering. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and maybe it would be worthwhile to just take a look at uh, your the presentation you skipped over, which was the, you know, the primary asset allocation one, and look at review our current uh, CMAs. Uh, I'm not sure what page that's on. I'm happy to do so. So, um, or, 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 or here we have. Is this a good slide to start on? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I was, I was just slide 10, which had the uh, changes from last year, but if we want to start 10. Oh, yeah, right. sure, so we, we can get into it. sort of our development process. So typically there aren't a ton of changes long term because we are looking at 20 years. You see relatively incremental changes year to year. We did see pretty large changes in our expectations last year when we presented this, mainly because interest rates were just so much higher and interest rates hadn't 
um, risen that precipitously in um, you know most of the time period that we've been developing capital market expectations. This year's study, however, which is based on the time period from the end of December 2022 to the end of December 2023, interest rates kind of ended up where they started. Um, and uh, equity markets did do well, so that kind of borrows on a valuation basis from future returns. So you'll see slightly lower returns for um, our equity expectations. One change that we made to our modeling, you know, our, we don't change our model a huge amount year to year, but of course we're always looking to make improvements, is that we're capping the impact of currency on our non-US returns more than we were so in the past. We used to cap that currency impact at 100 basis points, now we're capping it at 50 basis points. A big reason for that is we just, currency is really hard to predict. We have the least amount of confidence in those um, currency return impacts. And so we wanted it to impact our, our returns less. And so um, an outcome of that is that our expectations for non-US international equity and emerging markets equity is, are lower than they were in the past. We also extended our look back period for volatility from 15 to 20 years, mainly because we didn't want the global financial crisis volatility from 08 to drop out of those expectations. We want a, a broader um, look back period. Um, so in uh, that basically summarizes some of the changes, but I think it's useful to take a look at how our return expectations change for your actual asset classes in your portfolio. We model over 100 asset classes, but some of them are very specific. Um, somebody might invest in cryptocurrency and they want an expectation for that, for example. Um, so here are the asset classes that are in your portfolio. And you can see here that, as I mentioned, public equity expectations came down a bit, both because market returns were good last year and also because we're now capping the currency impact. Um, you can see that private markets rose slightly um, in terms of the expectation. Um, there are some lower borrowing costs at the high yield end of the market um, that is positive for private markets assets. Um, spreads are very tight in high yield bonds, so those expectations came down a bit. Um, and you can see the different impacts. We didn't have a change in expected return for long-term government bonds. And then you can see the impact of these changes from 2023 to 2024. So using our 2023 expectations, we expected an 8.8% .8 return per year for your fund. Um, now we expect 8.5% per year, so relatively incremental. And um, and also, you know, this is still, you know, very well above your actuarial assumed rate of return, so we think you have a high probability of hitting it. Can I ask a quick question? question? Absolutely. Uh, your standard deviations tend to be a little higher the way you calculate them than Varus's, correct? Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, ours, our expectations are, um, uh, we sort of artificially inflate private market standard deviations to mm. reflect what we think is the actual experience and not just based on accounting valuation. Um, I believe folks are on from Varus and they could talk about how they um, they calculate their standard deviation, but. I think they're taking a look at you know the environment that your fund is operating in and how the different asset classes interact in a different way than we are. That, that, that's okay. I, I just wanted to just clarify at the highest level. Thank you. And, and then slipping back to your previous slide, 26, the uh, the expectations for private markets that lumps together both ec private credit, private debt, private uh, uh, different private types of private markets. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, so, because uh, it's going the opposite direction direction from public equity in terms of the expectations from 23 to 24. That's uh, correct. And a lot of that is because we, you have a significant non-U.S. public equity allocation and our change in how we calculate the currency impact, therefore, um, affected public equity more than private markets, with mm -hmm. private markets being more heavily U.S. weighted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so the decision point uh, before us is, uh, would you like to address that? Well, so you have two options, mm -hmm. which is status quo, <coughs> not make any change, mm -hmm. or the IC's recommendation was to look at if we move 2% from investment grade bonds to long-term government bonds, what impact it has on the portfolio. So we can certainly, we can certainly consider that. Um, 
those are the two options that are really on the table at this point. Okay. And just to be clear, it's not an IC recommendation uh, to adopt a change. It was to bring the plan, um, continue mm -hmm. as, as we're currently allocated, and then there was a suggestion made at the committee mm -hmm. to uh, f um, favor government bonds over investment grade bonds uh, for some short-term purposes. and. Uh, the thinking at the committee was that it doesn't, uh, you know, to me the most important thing is the volatility on the portfolio, and it, it doesn't affect that. Um, and, and as Laura pointed out, it may have some long-term benefits. Um, we asked the staff, the investment staff, if transaction costs would be an issue uh, for making such a minor change, and I think you said that they were negligible. Yeah, I mean, this is a very liquid asset class. And we already have long-term government bonds, so it's just a matter of switching from one to the other. Yeah. So it's it's a very trivial amount, yeah. uh, but they are real costs, but it's trivial. Yeah. Uh, and you're right, it was not a recommendation from the IC, but mm -hmm. uh, just a request from the IC to see how it mm -hmm. will impact the portfolio. So, yeah. Laura, I do have a question. So um, financial theory says that investment grade bonds would be more risky than long-term government bonds and generally have a um, somewhat higher return. And I'm wondering why the assumption is different here, and it may be actual experience or something like that, but um, if you could just address that, that'd help me. Sure, yeah, long-term government bonds um, do have more volatility in them just because of the longer duration. So the, um, the longer duration means that you know, changes in interest rates affect long-term government bonds more than changes in interest rates do for investment-grade bonds. And, you know, that relationship holds as well if we were looking at, say, short-term bonds relative to investment-grade yeah. bonds. So short-term bonds are going to be less affected by changes in, in interest rates than investment-grade bonds. So I, the historical experience has been that long-term government bonds are much more volatile than investment-grade bonds. Okay. okay. And when we talk about long-term government bonds, are we talking about 10 years, 20 years? 20 years plus. 20 years 20 plus. plus. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Treasury index. Yeah. yeah. So we'd be exchanging credit risk for duration risk. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we're making this move. So I think the, the impetus for this actually uh, was something that I suggested at the IC. Uh, if you will put your history hats on, if you will call about a year ago, my, my theme for the year was uh, we should uh, de-emphasize our China investment. And um, we elected not to do that. And uh, lo and behold, the, uh, the China market has not revived. It's, it's uh, done poorly. My investment theme for this year is geopolitical risk. And what can we do to minimize that? without trying to identify a specific risk or combination of risks or also being aware of the black swan unknown risk. Um, Long-term government bonds is the one asset class that does well when there is significant systemic or geopolitical risk. And I just thought we might edge a little bit more in that direction to protect ourselves uh, in case uh, some untoward events should happen. And that was largely my thinking. That's. Uh, you know, it seems like every year there's some theme that grabs a hold of me, and uh, this is this is this year's version. So, yeah. so it, Mr. It Chairman, may I make a comment? You so may. you said we are exchanging credit risk for duration risk, mm -hmm. partly because investment grade bonds also have government bonds in them, so they they're not they don't have credit yeah. risk in as much as long term government bonds don't have credit risk. So it's only partly credit risk. Right. Well, we match for the IG bond. We match the AG. Is That's right. A, and yeah, the AG has a, is a healthy, all bonds, which include both corporate bond and, and treasury bond. That's so right. it's, That's why the, the change is actually quite minor. That's uh, right. Uh, but it's an edge in that direction. So. Well, and I think that we currently are seeing an a uncertain geopolitical mm -hmm. environment at the present mm -hmm. time. So. Well, uh, if there's any other questions, if anyone would like to make a formulation whether to adopt this change or not. May I also add one more comment? You may. So I would refrain from, as I've said in the past, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the current market environment and the next 12 months because it is strategic asset allocation. Um, so as you think about whether to make this move or not, 
I think the factor should not be whether there's uncertainty in the market now, mm -hmm. because that could clear up in six months or 12 months, or it could get worse, we don't know. But if the board thinks that longer term, <coughs> strategically, it's good to have 4% or 5% in long-term government bonds as opposed to 2%, mm -hmm. then I would consider this change. So I think that's the way I would look at it, rather than think about the geopolitical situation or anything else that's affecting the markets now. Yeah, I, I was going to make similar comments. Uh, I mean, the change is so minor. On the one hand, I'm ambivalent, but on the other hand, uh, it feels uh, uh, tactically driven to the short term, and I, I think we need to try to avoid that type of thinking when we have a long-term horizon. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very small change. Yeah, and if you all feel that longer term, we should have 4% in long-term government bonds, and long-term government bonds can be a good hedge, mm -hmm. then I would certainly consider that. Well, You're a better person than me if you can figure that mm -hmm. out over the next 20 years. <laughs> and, and the prediction is that it'd give us a higher, re slightly higher return. Long-term bonds would because they're riskier, yes. You're, a, you're actually adding a little bit of risk to the portfolio yeah. Yeah. by doing and that. And therefore a little return. Uh, I would see it as a combination of tactical and strategic uh, realignment. I think the longer term, uh, geopolitical risk environment is higher now than it has been in the past. And uh, while I agree we should have absolutely be long-term investors and, and be looking at a strategic asset allocation, there's absolutely no reason in my mind why that doesn't, why our thinking about that and our evaluation of that can change year to year and we can have at least minor shifts in the portfolio to accommodate uh, developing uh, events. So. Uh I, I don't agree with that statement, okay. so just, yeah, may, just, may that, just that, that, that doesn't square with strategic asset allocation. So <laughs> may I weigh in just really briefly? So from a fiduciary standpoint, mm -hmm. these governing documents, such as the strategic al asset allocation, the IPS, these are long-term documents, and we do have a long-term horizon. And so one of the things to take into consideration is precedent setting. So if we start doing this little turning of the knob for these little things that may be negligible, right? Like we, we all acknowledge mm -hmm. this is a slight change, but it sets a precedent for the future boards that may change in composition from those who are sitting here today. And so I do wanna just put that in everyone's mind when considering is this worth making the precedent set to make that slight adjustment? Or is this something where it's a dire market situation where we do need to act for a long-term horizon that would put us, you know, five, 10 years later, your successors on, on this board in a better position to handle whatever political long-term issues that may arise at that time. Because it, like, to Prabhu's point, things go up and down. If you recall, 2020, real estate was booming. Everybody wanted to be in real estate and up their real estate asset allocation, and now real estate's not booming. And so if we were to react in those ways, the, the lag on it, we shouldn't be looking at immediate returns, but rather in the long term, would that position us in a way where we can meet our mm -hmm. pension payment obligations at that point? Mm -hmm. But again, this is negligible, it sounds like. You know, it's not really... But, that but, big of a deal, but I do want to just raise the precedent setting mm -hmm. issue for the board to consider. But, but I am concerned about the, the, the impetus to want to tweak as well for the reasons you highlighted. And, you know, we had a presentation where at the uh, typical plans or best practices is three to five years revisiting asset allocation. The comment was made that, you know, things can get swept under the rug of best practices. Actually, best practices are best practices because they've been studied and they're trying and true and so i have been trying hard uh, to keep this board from uh, tinkering the capital markets expectations haven't changed significantly i think that's what we should have focused on they did back in march of 2020 and so i think we made a really important move at that time um so you know that's been uh, my mantra for seven years and i accept all those inputs i would say that in the global sense if the asset allocation never changes, we you know, might be over-invested in buggy whips. So we, we do need to accommodate and-, and But, uh, but no, one, no one said that. Uh, that's a straw man, Spencer. Uh, fair enough, but uh, it's, it's an extreme version of th things, things do change. The long-term outlook does change. Uh, the CMAs themselves, as we have seen, uh, you know, have con consistently uh, overrated their prospects for emerging markets. So the-, the uh, Capital markets expectations are just that, expectations. And uh, we have to apply our also our own um, judgment, our own insight, and our own experience to that. 
and uh, I believe that we can and should do that. I believe that's our charge as trustees of the board. Yeah, but the, the capital markets assumptions are far deeper than, uh, they're, they're imperfect, but to point, then I guess we have to point out the imperfection of every individual trustee's background and experience as well, given no one really has any investment experience on the board. Uh, uh, agreed, but uh, I have a great belief in the wisdom of crowds. So collectively, I think we can make, make those judgments uh, just as well as uh, <laughs> Seven markets. inexperienced people are not a crowd. Well, it's the, it's the biggest crowd we have. And therefore, caution and prudence is also a part of our in, charter in, and our indeed, fiduciary duty. Indeed, well, but, and, and, and that's and, why this is a very what, incremental change. Knowing what we're expert at and what we're not. Mm -hmm. Any further comments from trustees who, who have avoided weighing in on this? I would just like to ask our CIO, Polani, what your position is on this. Yeah, I mean, it's a very trivial change, right? Uh, from an impact perspective, as uh, the chair pointed out, and as Laura pointed out. But I do like Maytag's point, which I've made repeatedly to this board and to your sister board, is that just because we look at strategic asset allocation every year, you should not feel compelled to change it. And so we tweaked the language last year in the IPS to say, we're not going to do this every year. In fact, our consultants made a strong point saying that uh, best practices suggest that uh, SAA should be looked at every three to five years. So for that reason, uh, and to, you know, to, to prevent, I don't know, how do I call this? Bad behavior, tweaking the, mm -hmm. uh, the pension to tweak just because it's in front of you. Uh, so for that reason, I would like to avoid that. Uh, but as I said, if you all as a board think that you know, over the long term, long term government bonds are a good hedge, and therefore we should be at some other number than 2% strategically, then I can buy that decision. In fact, if you made that decision today, I'm going to go away thinking this is a strategic board, not a tactical board, and they've made a strategic decision. Because otherwise, it's, I, I don't like tactical decisions. I'm myself the world's worst market timer. And to me, I don't know what's going to happen in the next three to six months. Are we going to have World War Three? Is everything going to be fine by you know January 2025? Are we going to be in another bull market? Who knows? You know, those are unknowns. Mm -hmm. um, so, for the reasons that uh, Council Chin uh, emphasized, I would say that we should think of ourselves as strategic decision makers. We should question capital market assumptions because they drive strategic asset allocation. And I think the IC had an in-depth discussion on it. And I think we largely agree with Makita's capital market assumptions. No CMAs are perfect, um, and, but we agree with their process. But again, as the chair pointed out, they have also not been exactly correct in their you know, prediction on emerging markets. That's why, we should be focusing on CMAs and whether we agree with those CMAs, not on the output of the strategic asset allocation process. We shouldn't be tweaking the output. Uh, if we are comfortable with the inputs, we should accept the output, uh, as opposed to looking at the output and saying, oh, I'm going to look at this output, I'm going to look at the current market environment, I'm going to match the two, and I think there's some mismatch, I'm going to tweak one thing or the other. And especially, the most difficult thing to forecast in capital markets is duration, is interest rates. You can even forecast other things. Interest rates are the most difficult thing to forecast. And by tweaking duration, we are making a call on interest rates. And, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, well, we may not be any worse than anyone else, but I don't know if we will be any better than anybody else in, in, in predicting interest rates. Okay, can I make two, two last points? Uh, on the emerging markets, um, I'm not happy with emerging market performance, and it's been of a duration and length that's long enough that I think it bears reconsideration. But in the next 24 to 36 months, it could go so high that the, the trailing five and 10 years could look really attractive. And people, we have to keep that in mind, that it's tr the underperformance of emerging markets is true until it's not. Um, and, and then the second point I want to make is um, that previously, prior to Prabhu and Arne Andrews, there was a lot of tinkering with this plan year in and year out. 
And the, the comments that Maytag has made about precedent is really important because there will be boards, we will not all be trustees for 20 years. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is establish a set of processes and procedures that promotes a long-term view and thinking about how we optimize with a risk budget that makes sense given we have fiduciary duties to make sure that people get their checks on time every month. Th those are the driving big picture um, uh, factors that we need to be focused on. Let me just have a few final comments if I may. I think perhaps uh, Mr. Polani uh, has focused a little bit too much uh, on the tactical aspects of this move. Uh, Mikita was kind enough to do the analysis and states quite clearly moving 2% to long-term government bonds would be slightly protective during the most negative market scenarios. We need to look at this as a, a move that would be more perspective. I, a, a I bring in a much more questioning view. So at this point, I'll entertain a motion either to reaffirm the existing asset allocation or to make this move from IG bonds to treasury bonds. Would anyone like to formulate a motion? I move that we move to the new allocation with more okay. um, investment, long-term government bonds. Okay. From, is, yeah. is there a second to that motion? I second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Is there any further uh, trustee discussion? on the motion on the floor. Is there any public comment? Any public comment online? Seeing none. All right, then we are going to vote. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings, the motion is to move the allocation to uh, from investment grade bonds to long-term government bonds. Uh, how do you vote? Aye. That's an aye. aye. Trustee uh, Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Trustee Chandra? No. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? No. And the chair votes aye. Thank you all for that spirited discussion. It's a good discussion. Yes, indeed, it was a good discussion. And mm -hmm. I'm going to go away thinking this is a strategic board that mm -hmm. makes long term decisions. Okay. And if you all want to tweak this next year, I'm going to replay this to okay. you. Okay. You can, you can send a tape then, or your avatar, yes. <laughs> as opposed to appearing in person. All right, but thank but you, you are free to accept it in that spirit. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. we will move to 4C, mm -hmm. uh, discussion and action on private market spacing mm -hmm. plan. This was, again, discussed extensively mm -hmm. at the IC, and it was recommended for approval by the IC to the full board. Uh, with that, I'll turn this to Dinesh. And the reason that we do a pacing plan for private markets is that unlike public markets, we don't control the timing of cash flows into and out of these investments. So the way that private markets funds work is that we make a commitment to the fund. The funds each have an investment period where they can go out and find investments that are suitable for that strategy and call our capital through capital calls as they make those investments. And after the investments are made and they enact their value creation plans, during the harvest periods of those funds, they will realize those investments, sell them, and distribute that capital back to us. So the purpose of the pacing plan is to use our expectations for the plan market value over time based on the targeted asset allocation for each of the five private asset classes to determine the commitments that we need to make year by year to reach those targets and maintain those target levels. So here before you, we're going to show 10, 10 years of projections but seeking approval for one year of commitments for the next fiscal year. The pacing plan modeling was done by our consultants, so Newberger Berman for the buyout asset class, Makita Investment Group for our other four private asset classes. And a quick summary of the year in review, so we expect to complete 11 commitments for 81.5 million of the $130 million pacing plan. So this is for the fiscal year that ends on June 30th. It's about 63% of the pacing plan. The biggest reason for this is that third bullet, that there were no growth real estate commitments. 
So we spoke uh, a little bit earlier about growth real estate as being one of the more challenged sectors and the impact of interest rates still flowing through to valuations and transaction markets being slow. So the, the way that we approached growth real estate was that it didn't make sense to make incremental commitments. We already had existing fund managers that have dry powder and the ability to make investments. However, they were making investments very slowly, finding some good opportunities, but not enough to necessitate new commitments to be made there. Um, the other point is that fundraising has also gotten more challenging throughout private markets. Funds that maybe in the past took six to nine months to raise are now taking upwards of a year, in some cases two years. So this gives us some more flexibility that we can go in and watch how these funds that may have started investing last year or investing this year, how those make sense in 2024, late 2024, or in 2025, and then backfill those particular vintages. So um, that's one of the reasons that our pacing plan execution looks like it's less than the target. Our current positioning versus target is we're slightly overweight, so 23% of plan assets, the target is 21%. When we compare to last year's pacing plan of where we thought we would be as of June 30th of this year, we're about 2% higher than that, and that's mainly coming from the slowdown of realizations and distributions because the transaction markets throughout private markets have been slower as the, the interest rate move has um, made it harder and there's a bid ask spread as people want to get a good deal on investments and uh, the sellers want to get a higher price. They want to get what they thought their assets were worth a year ago or two years ago. So it started to narrow, but it's still, um, there's still some movement there. Um, I'll go to the next page that shows the breakdown between our five different private asset classes. I would point you to the far right, which shows the percentage of target that we committed from each of the five asset classes. So buyout, 100%. Uh, with venture capital, private debt, and private real assets, we're between 75 to 80 percent. One of the reasons for this is that we actually deferred some of the commitments that we had expected to make because of that fundraising environment being prolonged, where the incentive or fee discount that's offered up front isn't enough to take on that risk if something were to happen in the next two years for a particular fund. And you'll see growth real estate being the zero percent. Here we show our current asset allocation by each of the five private asset classes. Buyout has the largest overweight at 3.9% overweight, mainly coming from good performance as well as larger commitments that we made back in 2017 and 18 when the buyout target allocation was higher. It used to be 10% of plan assets. And venture capital has an underweight of about 3.3%. Uh, this is the newest private asset class that was added in 2019, and we've been uh, slowly working our way towards that target. And I mentioned that we're about 2% above where we thought we would be in the last year's pacing plan. It's primarily coming from two asset classes, so buyout and growth real estate. So if you look on the, the far right column, so buyout is about $47 million higher than where we had thought we would be. Growth real estate is $24 million above where we thought we would be. Uh, the expectation is that these distributions should pick up in the near term, and we'll start to see those net asset values start to decline. Getting into how we got our pacing plan modeled for the upcoming fiscal year, the primary building block is the net asset value forecast over the next 10 years for the plan. The way we do this is we take our current values and layer in the expected return of the plan, as well as the actuarial assumptions of benefit payments um, out of the plan, as well as contributions into the plan, and we come up with the, the forecast. We do this on a year-by-year -year basis, and here we have a comparison of where the current net asset value forecasts are versus where we were last year. And surprisingly, they're actually quite close. Usually, uh, there's a much larger deviation between these. Last year, it varied between positive 7% to negative 7% in some years, but um, this year is more stable. This chart shows the, the expected private asset allocation over the next 10 years. The way to look at this is that the dark bars for each of the years is where we expect to be for each of the five different private asset classes. The light bars that are next to those for each of the years is where we would have to be if we were to be at the targets for each of those. So since it does take time to get to those targets and stay at those targets, you see that over the, the course of several years, some of the asset classes get closer and closer. Like with the buyout asset class, it starts to come down from 11%, closer to 8% in mid-2027. 
and others like venture capital, which is the, the green bar, which is at 0.9% currently, is able to get increased closer to the 4% target over the course of many years. And the numbers behind this pacing plan and for that, the chart that I just showed is shown on this page. And the, the bar that's highlighted is the expectation for the upcoming fiscal year, um, which is actually exactly the same as the pacing plan was in the last year. That's not a typo. It's just uh, the way that the pacing plan is intended to be is to smooth out commitments over the long term. And it just happened that each of the five ended up being exactly the same. Um, there was one takeaway from the um, investment committee where Chair Horowitz asked about, um, since our pacing plan is tied to our IPS, the IPS allows the investment staff to invest up to one and a half times the pacing plan plus under commitments from the previous years. Um, we were trying to confirm what those previous year under commitments were, and I had said that they were small, and in reality it was actually $7 million in years prior to fiscal year 23 to 24, so coming from private debt and venture capital, so not much more. The way to think about it is like the maximum that we could commit based on the IPS would be one and a half times $130 million, which is $195 million, plus the under commitments from the fiscal year 23 to 24, which is that difference between 130 and 81 and a half, plus that other 7 million from prior years that were under committed. So this was approved at the investment committee and we do need board approval today and happy to answer any questions. up longer than they were. Was that taken into consideration in terms of what you um, were forecasting for returns? So it is taken into account in the capital market assumptions that were done by Mikita in January. So that's okay. one of the building blocks for the pacing plan. Yes. Okay. Any, any, <coughs> any other questions from trustees? And, and probably worth noting, the, the recommendation <coughs> out of the IC was to approve the plan. <coughs> that's right. Sorry. I'd, I'd move to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll oh. second. We have a second from Trustee Abbott. Any further trustee discussion? Any public comments? Any public comments online? Looks like no. Uh, we'll go to a vote. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you so much, Dinesh. Thank you. So we are all right. On, yes, we are on, Mr. Next Chairman, item. to D, E, and F. Uh, I'm going to address all three together. Okay. You may want to consider them separately. Uh, so just by way of background, we've had our incumbent consulting firms, Makita and Veris, for four years. And uh, we've been generally happy with our investment consultants, but it's good practice to go out from time to time and see what else is available out there in terms of vendors. And uh, we are a public agency and transparency is important. And so with that in mind, we issued an RFP in January uh, and we broke it down into three parts, general consulting, risk consulting, and consulting for alternative investments. And the third category was added uh, because as you know, both boards have increased the share of private markets and we felt that getting specialized uh, research for private markets will be beneficial to the investment team. Uh, and we allowed consultants to pick and choose. Uh, they could respond to one or both or all three um, options. Uh, we got four responses. Uh, both incumbents responded. We also got two other, uh, one was from Alborn. Alborn is not currently a consultant, though they do provide some research for us. And the fourth was uh, a consultant who basically turned in an incomplete RFP and so we're disqualified. Mm -hmm. um, so we had extensive discussions. Uh, uh, staff actually read through all the RFPs. We had a scoring matrix which was provided to all the incumbents and we scored the consultants. Uh, we shared that with the IC chairs. Uh, the IC chairs also had a chance to review the RFPs and post that uh, on the guidance of the I, on IC chairs, we then brought this. We had further discussions with the consultants uh, in terms of fee negotiations and so on. And then we brought this to the IC for a full discussion. And the IC discussed this. And uh, you, the, the recommendations that you see here uh, were actually made by the IC for adoption by the full board. Uh, 
I do want to point out that um, that even though our assets have increased 37 percent over the last four years, we have managed to negotiate this to a point where our consulting fees are actually going to go down by 12 percent. So staff worked very hard on that, and we are satisfied with the recommendation. Um, we are giving up the use of one particular tool, and the IC very kindly pointed out to us that they would like us to have all the tools that we need to do our job. So we're going to try out. Uh, we have a way of accessing this particular tool, uh, but we are going to try this for a year, and if we need additional tools, we will come back to the board. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. but could you tell me a little bit more about Alborn? Yeah, Alborn is another consulting firm and we actually do have a relationship with Alborn at the moment to get hedge fund research. Their expertise is really alternative investments and uh, we've had very good experience with them uh, in the past in hedge fund research and they've also gone above and beyond just hedge fund research when we've needed um, other uh, feedback from them. In fact, we were able to get uh, a fee saving of about $400,000 uh, last year uh, because we were able to use Alborn to aggregate assets for a particular uh, investment management contract. And so staff was very impressed with their, with their capabilities on the private market side, uh, which is why we're going to contract with them now. Thank you. We had a more substantial relationship with them in the past. It might have even predated. That's uh, right. Yeah, and That's so uh, we had a big absolute return portfolio, which thankfully we don't anymore. And so we have legacy with them, and the staff thought that there were certain pieces of their services that were still valuable. And I'll just continue that I, as I've seen the process that the staff went through, it was super thorough. So I think the committee was confident in their recommendations. I wonder if you want to comment on um, the lack of response to our request for proposals. Uh, I mean, there is a universe of, of other, we're very happy with Makita, I think, uh, and, and the other, and Veris, but we haven't seen a lot of people uh, stepping forward to, to submit uh, proposals to us. So, should and, I be and, I just, and maybe just because I just came from Pension Bridge where there are when it was calling with investment advisors and why aren't they uh, yeah. responding to us? Should I be politically correct? I, I was wondering. I would advise it, but just, you know, your general sense of it for I, the, for I, the Maybe board. I should borrow that placard from that staff uses. <laughs> no comment. Yeah, no. Uh, okay, three reasons, I think. Mm -hmm. One is that there's been a lot of consolidation in the investment mm -hmm. consulting world. And over the, I've, I've worked with consultants for 25 years, and the, shr the universe of consultants has shrunk. In fact, both Makita and Veris, interestingly, in the last four years have absorbed other consulting firms. Uh, Makita took over Pension Consulting Alliance, which is a very big consulting firm. And Veris took over, I believe, a company called Wurtson Company, which is Seattle-based. So the universe of consultants has shrunk, so there's fewer options out there. Uh, that's one reason. Um, the second reason is, you know, there could be, actually there's four reasons. The second reason is that consultants may have felt that the incumbents stood a stronger chance um, because we do have very good relationships with our incumbents mm -hmm. and they've done a great job. Sure. And Makita and Veris are known to be very good cons mm -hmm. investment consulting firms. So people actually track board meetings when they submit RFPs and they know the relationship that plans have with consultants mm -hmm. and sometimes it can be contentious and in that case you will see more responses so mm -hmm. since we did not have that that could be I'm just speculating here by the way sure uh, that's another reason the third reason is that um, it's harder to work with two boards than it is to work with one board uh, in terms of costs right uh, so if you have two boards, uh, then it's, I don't want to speak for Laura or Eileen, even if it's not twice the work, it might be, say, 1.7 times the work or something like that. So that's a tough assignment. So that could be another reason. Um, the fourth reason 
is, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, you know, we've had poor governance in the past. I think that has changed. And so we've had very interesting times with consultants dating back more than 10 years ago. Uh, and I think we've made enormous strides in terms of uh, you know, our governance and the way we work with consultants and the transparency that you know we bring to the plan now. And so I think all of that has changed and I think, but some of that bad reputation might still linger out there uh, and consulting firms not wanting. One of my colleagues pointed out that there was a consulting firm many, many, many years ago that fired us. Um, so they might still want, not want to respond to the RFP. And, uh, and likewise, we did the same with another consulting firm. We, we actually changed consultants. So some of that history might still be out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm again, Mr. Chairman, I'm just speculating here. Yeah, the, uh, my understanding is there was a uh, consultant that was led to believe that, that they were going to get a mandate um, prior to it actually having been approved by both boards. And so that might have left a bad taste in the mouth of that particular consultant as well. So there, there are a bunch of anecdotes like that. Yeah, and there was a <laughs> there was an instance many years ago. I mean, these are all these are this is publicly known. So mm -hmm. I'm not uh, uh, a consultant was actually asked not to participate in a board deliberation on on investments. This is many 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 years ago, mm -hmm. and so that sort of behavior uh, doesn't sit well, and you know memories are long. So. Okay. Well, hopefully the next cycle we will have. Uh, have rehabilitated our reputation sufficiently that we have at least one or two more bidders. Um, but with that, I, unless anyone has objection. Uh, so uh, each of these contracts need to be voted on separately. Okay, I was going to say we can't have an can't. omnibus uh, yeah. bill to yeah. accept all. Okay. So uh, let's take them in order. Then uh, the Makita contract, do we have a motion to accept the this contract as uh, presented by uh, staff? So moved. I'm sorry, for mm -hmm. clarification, there's no contract that's being subject to approval. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. rather to um, designate in a, the CEO to negotiate and execute a five-year contract. So the contract itself is not included here yeah. for approval, um, but rather will okay. be in negotiations up to a limit of not to exceed spending amount. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So do we have a motion under item 4D? Um, to empower the CIO and staff to negotiate and execute a five-year contract not to exceed $700,400 per year. So shared, moved. Oh, sorry. Shared 50-50 with police and fire. May I please just get a <laughs> clarification? Um, would it, are you designating the CIO to do the negotiations? It's agendized for the secretary, meaning the CEO. If I, if I may make a suggestion, mm -hmm. uh, why change precedent? I think it should be the secretary, which is the CEO. Okay, very well then. Work closely with the CIO and the <laughs> Collaboratively, no doubt. Trying um, to keep you to form here, so um, okay. would you make an amendment to your motion? I to do. Reflect that thing. Uh, it's not. An, it's not my motion. It is uh, Trustee Chandra's. Okay. I have to restate the motion. You just say uh, you accept the. The, the amendment to the motion. I accept the, the amendment to to my motion. Very good. Is there a second to that amended motion? I'll second. We have a second from Trustee Abbott. Is any further discussion from trustees? Any public comment? Seeing none, we vote. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Move on to item 4E, um, which is authorizing the secretary to negotiate an executive five-year contract with Vera's advisory, not to exceed $200,000 a year to be shared 50-50 with the police and fire. Do we have a motion uh, uh, to move that forward? So moved again. We have a motion from Trustee Chandra. Do we have a second? I have second. We have a second from Trustee Abbott. Is there any further discussion, any public comment? Seeing none, uh, Vice Chair Jennings, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. Chair votes aye. And finally, uh, we have a, uh, uh, can we hear a motion to authorize the secretary to negotiate and execute a five-year contract not to exceed 
the uh, specified amount with Alborn uh, Advisory, Alborn America LLC. Uh, we have a motion from Trustee Abbott. Do we have a second? second? We have a second from Trustee Faulkner. Any further trustee discussion? Any public comment? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, tr trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so all three are approved. I do want to say, Mr. Chair, congratulate mm -hmm. the staff for getting the 36% reduction. Yes, well done. Well done in that regard. Thank you. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's on to item 5, 5A, all business, and we have a discussion and action on the proposed administrative budget. Who will present on that? Sure, I will be presenting that. Okay, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Office of, um, Retirement Services Deputy Director. Uh, this item before the board is seeking approval for the updated org chart and employee count as part of the budget for the upcoming fiscal year 24 25. Um, the first two attachments are the same uh, from your March meetings, and those were approved. Um, the information that has changed is shown on this third attachment, which is up on the screen right now. Um, it shows the revised slides, um, and the revised slides show the changes with the highlights, so the, the um, number of staff and the org chart. Um, as I said, the board heard and approved the budget request for the fiscal year 24-25 at their March meetings. However, at the time, it was noted we hadn't gotten any feedback from uh, the mayor's office um, on the position requests. So we since have heard from the mayor's office and uh, whereas they are supporting um, two of our requests, so the request for the customer service uh, senior office specialist um, and our Medicare health benefit analyst, um, they have indicated that at this time they're not supporting the addition of a third position that was requested, uh, a compliance officer senior analyst in our accounting group. Uh, this position had been included in the budget request and the org chart uh, that was presented at the March meetings, um, and now this uh, third attachment that's um, here and this org chart that's shown um, is showing that compliance officer has been removed, um, and that would bring the full-time positions um, in ORS from 45 uh, or to 45 rather than the 46. Um, and uh, we are requesting approval for these changes in the budget. All right, thank you. Any questions from trustees on the amended org chart? I have a question. Um, sorry, did... Uh, go ahead, uh, right. Trustee Abbott. So I know that the compliance position was a really important one from the perspective of the board because there were some deficiencies that we had noted previously and I'm wondering if this position since this position has not been approved how does the office of ORS plan to address those needs how does the work get done yeah um, how does the work get done mm -hmm. I mean is is there a consultant outside that you would do in an increase in budget or will you readjust What's going on? I'm just curious. We're assessing the situation um, um, and looking at the different alternatives. Uh, we had thought about um, requesting an overstrength, which would have been a limited time position. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, the mayor's office has indicated they wouldn't uh, be in support of that either. Um, of course, in their communication, they said at this time. So there's possibly hope at a different time that they, they may. Uh, so we're going to, you know, wait and see and, and see what we can do. But in the in the interim, it it is going to be a case of, you know, existing staff taking on parts of that work. It's not going to get as done as quickly, though. I mean, their plates are already full. But you know, we'll, we'll have to see what we can do, and if necessary, then maybe even a temp resource, like a temporary. Um, resource that could be brought in. Uh, I have a question on that. If you bring in a temp view to do that, it, doesn't that have to go through um, finance? Or it, it, the request the re would have to go through finance, yes. So if they're denying all of these because they want it to be absorbed, then I assume they're going to deny that. It's possible. Um, can you explain a little bit more what 
the position, the new position you were asking, the senior uh, analyst, what specifically were they going to do to address the, the concerns that came from the audit that we had with the city auditor? So what, so what we had we envisaged for that position was mm -hmm. um, overseeing our contract and procurement um, and un the overseeing the ongoing monitoring of contracts. Um, and that would have entailed like working with our managers to draft RFPs and um, uh, go through um, a competitive process. Um, and then just maintain our logs of you know RFPs and RFQs. Um, we also wanted them to oversee uh, trustee and staff travel um, and oversee compliance with policies and procedures um, and be that person to develop new procedures um, and update existing procedures where, where um, that was necessary. Um, our prior internal auditor had um, noted, and, and so did the city internal auditor, some um, outdated policies and procedures, and so that position was going to be um, dedicated to that sort of work. Yeah, and didn't you previously also say maybe that person would do what? some training? And uh, ho sorry, hold on, I Vice hear, Chair Jennings. Hear, yes, Trustee Jennings. Um, one other thing I, w I did want to, because it's an important element, is also um, develop a training program for our staff, um, and that, pr that position was yeah. going to oversee that program, but... Um, so I guess um, my input on that, um, given that the city manager offered um, the city to assist um, for training uh, on those policies that meet the city policy standards, you know, that are already out there, they do have an excellent training program that can be utilized. So I think we could utilize that as to the policies that do not impact our tax deferred status, I believe we have already gone forward with a documentation where we've looked at that um, overall. Uh, I think the city manager wanted to have some input on that, uh, but we've already done the work. So I think you pretty much have what you need there. Um, Travel, I mean, you already have people, you know, set up for in the department. But I guess uh, from a policy standpoint, my piece would be as to developing uh, a database of your current existing contracts that are out there that would need RFP and tracking of that. Um, we have our... We have Cortex, we have, you know, uh, Reed Smith. We have opportunities to utilize someone to come in and kind of set up that structure that then someone could just follow. And, and we do have um, examples of um, looking at Brad Poo and his team who just did this RFP for, you know, our three investment officers. So, uh, I mean, um, consultants uh, seem to make that work pretty well. So I think we can kind of cobble together something and come up with a plan. Uh, that would be my recommendation, uh, just given that uh, the city who approves these requests are not going to make that approval on the budget. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Trustee Abbott, did you have a no. further question? Okay. No. Any? Council Member Davis. Uh, we discussed this on Tuesday at Council with the, um, the most recent audit for ORS from our city auditor, and I want to thank Trustee Jennings, Vice Chair Jennings, for, uh, for your comments. I know being in part of PRNS, cobbling together staffing and figuring out how the work is going to get done, is uh, she's no stranger to that because PRNS has to do that on a very regular basis. And I will remind you that your, <laughs> your budget shares with, with their budget. Um, so we have a pretty severe budget deficit. It's not the most severe of the 2000s, but it is a $25 million structural deficit and another, uh, another 25 million on top of that that we think we're gonna have to spend for our regional stormwater permit. 
So we're looking at trying to fill a $50 million gap and every single department is looking at cuts. Um, so the fact that you got two new positions is certainly an outlier in terms of all the other departments in the city. One of the things that, that we discussed on Tuesday is that ORS is a department in the city and as such, uh, working more collaboratively with, with the other departments can be a way to help fill some of the, some of the gaps in, and, and some of the findings help, help really make right some of the findings that um, the city auditor put into his report. So we would really recommend, and, and we have as a city, it was part of, part of our motions for the two items, um, have as a city recommended a closer and more collaborative approach with the other departments, specifically finance and procurement. Um, and, and that was well received by you, Roberto, which I appreciate. And, and I think that it really goes along with the city manager's one team approach and really cross collaborating across departments. So that's something that we, we recommend as a city council and, um, and that was a unanimous vote, by the way. All right, thank you, Council Member Davis. Um, so we're being asked to approve the budget at this point. Uh, any anyone would like to make a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. We have a motion from Trustee Linder. Is there a second? Second. Was that, was that Trustee Avasti? Thank you. Any further trustee discussion on this item? Any public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings, how do you vote? Uh, Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. So the budget is approved. Uh, we're up to 5B, discussion action on a proposed city ordinance to amend the municipal code uh, with the uh, various amendments uh, attached. Uh, who will be addressing this item? Very well. Um, so we've had a chance to look at the proposed city, um, the city proposed amendments to the municipal code on contract and procurement issues as it relates to the ORS operations and the board's authority on those issues. Uh, with regard to this particular agenda item, the action requested is to authorize plans fiduciary and tax council to share our analysis and recommendations to conform the proposed muni code changes with uh, fiduciary and IRS requirements. Um, we also have our tax counsel present online if there's any questions for her as well. Um, but again, we've looked at the proposed changes both from a mm -hmm. fiduciary perspective and a tax perspective. And some of our concerns regard and relate around the duty of loyalty owed to the plan members as well as the board's contracting authority, not so much the procurement process leading up to the authority, the contracting authority, but just around the contracting authority piece itself. Um, we, our tax council has also looked at it and is present today to explain any of the relevant tax considerations with regard to the muni code changes. And again, at the end of the day, once you've heard from both of us and answered any questions that we may have for you, or you may have for us, that um, we share our analysis and recommendations. Okay. And, and by share, you mean share it with the city? Attorney's uh, office. Attorney's office, very good. Are there, I know we discussed this uh, to some degree in closed session, is there any questions from trustees or members of the public or Council Member Davis? Okay. Uh, so I guess we need a motion then to uh, approve the memo? No, it's to, to authorize. To, to waive privilege, right? No, that's been done. No, so this mm -hmm. is this is to authorize um, the tax council and fiduciary council. Now, again, just mm -hmm. by way of background, the board acts together collectively 
and I'm not authorized to do anything unless the board has authorized me to do something. And so in this instance, under the Muni Code, it requires the board to provide comments and recommendations to the proposed Muni Code changes, and mm -hmm. I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of the board mm -hmm. and share that analysis until the board acts to allow us to do that. So that's what this agenda item is for. Okay, the authorization. And have you received that authorization from police and fire yet, or that's yes. yet you have done? Okay. Okay, so now with a, a more uh, complete understanding, would anyone like to venture a motion? I will move such authorization. Very good. Mo motion from Trustee Linder. Is there a second? I'll second it. We have a second from Trustee Chandra. Is there any further discussion or questions from trustees or from the public? Uh, seeing none, uh, Vice Chair Jennings, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. I vote aye. So you now have that authorization. Thank you. Godspeed. <laughs> Item 6A, oral update from our CEO, Mr. Pena. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So just a, a few comments. Uh, April is up on us, which means that the cost of living adjustment will be paid for um, at the end of this month to retirees. And that also uh, means that those retirees that are impacted by the Internal, Internal Revenue Code uh, Section 415B, which limits the total annual payment on, on a pension benefit, will see that adjustments as well in that retirement payment. Um, also wanted to let you know that our quarterly retirement connection newsletter uh, was already distributed to retirees and members, uh, and I had a message to our members letting them know about my impending uh, upcoming retirement in the next few months. Um, also wanted to remind you that uh, um, if you haven't done so already, that to please make sure to uh, write a check to our office for the trustee, the fiduciary insurance waiver. Um, we have three insurances, uh, $25 each, so that's $75. The check should be made out to the City of San Jose Office of Retirement Services. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out, and uh, we can provide you more. Could you have, in the past, an email's been sent to all of us? And yeah, we, we, yeah, and we'll, we'll we send the email. Okay. Yes. yes. With all that information. Yes. Okay. Lastly, uh, I wanted to let you know, uh, as Councilmember Davis indicated, I attended the, uh, it was a busy day on April 16. I attended uh, the City Council meeting in the morning and the afternoon. In the afternoon, um, there were two items. Uh, that are uh, 3.4, one of them has to do with the um, adoption of city policies and recommended policies for re regarding uh, the Office of Retirement Services and then the audit by the city auditor on the procurement process of our office. Uh, I think as Council Member uh, Davis indicated, um, um, they, they were uh, a lot of comments at the, at the meeting uh, and it, there was direction to the city manager which she has reached out already to our office uh, and um, obviously as she suggested about a collaborative approach of working between our office and, and the city which as uh, Casamara Davis indicated I, I was uh, certainly in favor of it. Uh, um, I don't want to suggest that um, uh, we had not done uh, or have not been collaborative with the city in the past, but certainly we can do a better job, and so we stand ready to do that. Um, and as part of the audit, um, as, as, as you approve the budget, uh, one of the responses um, dealing with the findings of the, of the audit by the city auditor had to do with that compliance position. Um, the mayor uh, explained uh, the, the, the rationale behind the city mayor, the mayor's office uh, uh, not supporting that particular request. I think as Barbara indicated, we, we stand ready to, to work in implementation. Council Member Davis actually uh, asked for an info memo from our office in terms of um, potential dates that we expect we'll be ready to implement the recommendations by the auditors, which will be forthcoming. Um, we have put together a team at the office to find out how we're going to tackle this. The city also has already reached out, so an upcoming meeting is pending between 
city manager's office and our office, uh, I, along with finance and other groups at the city. Uh, and as you all know, we're working the, uh, these days uh, uh, on a collaborative approach with the uh, information technology office of the city of San Jose. So uh, a lot of work to be done uh, is forthcoming. Uh, as soon as we are ready with those uh, target dates, we will remain issuing the info memo uh, to the city council. And um, again, it was uh, a productive discussion. And uh, as I mentioned at the city council meeting, we stand ready to, uh, to work with the city and make sure that in those cases where there might be some difference of opinion or some questions that we can work through then and we can uh, I agree how we can move forward because at the end of the day, we just want to make sure that you know um, the plans are properly uh, served and so are the members and that we actually conduct operations in a reasonable and uh, efficient manner. So that's at the end of the day, uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we uh, benefit the members of the plan. So with that, that concludes uh, my comments, Mr. Chair, but I'm happy to answer any specific questions. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from uh, trustees? Any questions from anybody online? We see none. Move forward to item 6B, oral update from our city council liaison. Thank Ms. You. Davis. Thank you. Just to um, add a little bit to Roberto's uh, comments, it was, um, uh, I think it was a nice, robust discussion. One of the things that, that we're concerned about on con council is, again, ORS is a department of the city. All of the employees in ORS are city employees. And we want to make sure that there is um, not just collaboration, but also equity of, in the way that employees are treated, that due process happens in the same way uh, across all of our departments. And so that was one of the discussions that happened. Uh, there's some concern about not adopting all of the city policies, especially as regards to employees and the way that the way that uh, work is done, because we have we have employee classes that are shared across all the departments, including ORS. So. Um, that was part of the discussion on the on the policy item, um, and we did not just just to be clear, we did not feel that it was our place to uh, approve your policies. Uh, we did accept the the report on the policies, but we did not feel that it was our place to actually approve those policies. So we did not do that. And then the other discussion that we had was about, and I know your audit committee got a. Uh, got a presentation on the retirement services audit from the Office of the City Auditor, and that is the most recent one released April 2024. That title is Retirement Services, the Office Has Not Consistently Followed City Procurement Policies and Standard Practices, so there were a couple of findings on that. And I just want to make sure the board is aware that is not the only um, that is not the only audit that report that has come out. There was also one in October of 2023, and that was uh, titled Retirement Services Interim Report on the Alignment of Controls Between the City and the Office of Retirement Services. And that was really to review um, the policies and procedures and found uh, the main finding there was that the, there should be um, better alignment because that would strengthen controls, better alignment in the policies to strengthen controls, internal controls over ORS operations. All of these, uh, both of these two audits were in response to a memo that um, I and Pam and the mayor submitted in June, which directed the city auditor to conduct um, an audit of ORS. Uh, obviously, it turned out to be a longer audit and multiple reports to address the following areas. And I don't know that I ever read these to you. I know that you had received that information, um, but it was about in identifying internal process controls for financial activities, such as accounting, purchasing, and contracting, identifying policies and procedures uh, around information systems and security. I believe you are familiar with uh, those findings as well. Compliance with city policies for financial activities, information systems, and security, and other rele relevant administrative functions. And then uh, number four, because we haven't looked at this in the most recent past, 
a comparison of the government structures of other governance structures of other pension plans, including board oversight of management's administrative functions and responsibilities, and that was covered in the first uh, in the first interim report in October of 2023. So those are all, of course, available on the on the city's website, and you're welcome to peruse those. I just wanted to make sure that this board was aware of all of those activities and the kind of the discussions that have been happening between uh, the city and the city attorney and the city departments, including the city manager, uh, over the last year. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a question for that. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Trust you mentioned that. that it is not the city council's place to approve our policies and that's why you didn't um, move on what was presented to you I, I'm I'm really confused um, I'm just confused uh, about that statement because you're asking for the for ORS to follow all the city policies we have examined those city policies as they pertain to ORS, as they pertain to fiduciary responsibility of the board to the, to the pension and to who the pension pays for. So I, I know that the city employees report, you know, some of the city was to the city. Um, so that adds complexity but I, d I don't understand what you said when you said not the city council's place to approve the ors policy can you explain that further please council member davis we have we think that you the that ors should follow the city policies so we're not in um we did not want to go to the additional step of of approving the additional policies so what was presented because they were not exactly the city policies, basically city council, or at least you and council member Foley disagree with, as well as the mayor, and so you didn't want to approve that. Is that what I'm hearing? We um, wanted, um, we, we asked Roberto to continue to work in coordination with the city manager on the policies. And uh, we think that there requires more discussion there. Yeah, that was the part that confused me, you know. So, but I think what's leading that is because it is the city council or the three people I just mentioned. Um, but it was voted on unanimously. So it was your impression that we should follow all the city policies. And that is why you didn't approve it, and that is why you're asking uh, Roberto to now work with the city manager. If there is need, what? yeah, so I guess the way that I would put it is I would not want ORS to have their own set of policies. I would prefer that we have city policies and that ORS needs, um, needs to have our city policies better reflect their needs than I would request and we did request that Roberta works with the city manager to ensure that the city policies are encompassing of the needs of ORS. Okay, I, I hear that. And the only other thing I would say is that um, I think as you look at the tax implications, as you look at various things, it is the board's responsibility to make sure that we uh, uphold our tax deferred status, that we follow um, the fiduciary responsibility to the, uh, the pension and to the, the people that it pay out. And that city council represents the sponsor. Um, and so we need to make sure that we um, maintain that, that you know, um, separation. Um, just like uh, the, Federated, uh, the Federal Reserve Board does not report directly to the president. Um, so it's important uh, for the employees, for the city employees, that you are so concerned about and to the tax deferred status. 
So I just end with that. And I hope you take that back to your members. Yeah, yeah, completely understand, of course, that the tax deferred status is uh, obviously very important. Um, we also are very desire, you know, desirous to ensure that the security of all of the personally identifiable information of the employees and all of the retirees is secure. Um, so we have, I think we have joint care and consideration for the, the members of the plan because they are all either current or former city employees. Any other trustees with questions on uh, the presentation from city council liaison? I guess I'd like to ask as a board, we are in receipt of a letter from city council, from the city attorney, I guess, uh, suggesting a ballot measure and we are also in receipt of letters from at least two unions in reaction to that letter. Uh, so I wondered if you wanted to comment on uh, this idea of a ballot measure, what might be the rationale behind it, and, and what your view of it is. Well, I would like to have more, more discussions, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think there is, there is a lot of concern among the council about um, the, the board's what has been happening in the department of ORS, which is the only department, as you know, that is not under the city manager or the city council's appointees. And the other city council appointees coordination with the city manager um, is much greater than, than the ORS coordination with the city manager and, and the city manager's office. And so, we had, as you probably know, uh, your former, one of your former auditors came to our city auditor with some concerns. We've had other concerns raised to the city council by employees um, of ORS, either current or former. And we then had the, uh, had the auditor, the city auditor look into some of those concerns. There have been other discussions, of course, that you all know about. Um, and we continue to have concerns about the board's main focus being on investments as, as provided in, uh, in state law and in city charter, and concerns about whether oversight of operations um, is happening in the level of detail that it needs to happen. And so that is where the idea for changing the appointment uh, came from. And I don't know if that's what needs to happen, honestly. Um, I think we need to have some more discussions and as such I, I have requested uh, the mayor and Pam Foley, Councilmember Foley and I meet with the chair and the vice chair of both the boards. I think I would still like that to happen and see if we can come to uh, an agreement with a more fulsome and direct conversation as opposed to shooting letters back and forth. Um, I think that would be a better way to handle, handle the situation and we can see if we can come to to a better and more uh, collaborative agreement. But as such, the board's, uh, the board's relationship with the city council is, not, is currently not collaborative, and I would say that's true in both directions. And I would like us to have a, um, a better relationship to ensure, again, that city employees across all departments, including ORS, are treated with due process and following the, the city policies, and especially the employment policies, so that we can, again, ensure that everyone is treated equally across the organization. And that's the main concern. Okay, thank you for your comments. I think that helps inform us a bit more. Appreciate that. I do have another comment. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings, Jennings, please go ahead. go ahead. So you're in receipt of also the union's responses, and they represent the, the city employees within the city as well as um, uh, the, well, they try to represent, I guess, maybe uh, um, certainly ORS and then also uh, the pension uh, as pension is extremely important 
to the city employees, right? That's one of the reasons um, people come to work for a municipality is because of a pension. Um, so maintaining our tax deferred status is critical. And um, I think you have receipts from two unions regarding that and probably soon we'll have one from police and fire. Um, so when you represent the city employees, I, I think that's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes I just wonder um, because, you know, in one way it's good to say one thing, in another way it's good to say another thing, and that makes me a little concerned, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, I think working collaboratively is extremely important. I think, you know, recognizing that city council represents the city of San Jose and that you are the sponsor of the pension is extremely important. Having you and uh, council member Foley sit on the boards, I think provides that collaborative environment and uh, conversations going back and forth are, are sought after. So um, I also believe on the one item you were talking about, uh, there was uh, after closed session, both in police and fire as well as federated, where uh, there was at great expense uh, a investigation that was independent that was provided both by uh, agreed upon um, through the union, through uh, the city uh, who was brought in uh, that it was basically uh, all the allegations were not legally founded, basically. I'm not using the right terminology. So, um, and Roberto, I think, has been very uh, willing uh, and um, should be willing to address all the auditor uh, responses. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, city employees are important to both of us, I think, uh, just uh, – but as uh, board members, we represent the fiduciary responsibility to maintain uh, their uh, payments, their tax deferred status, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yes, I did receive the letters, and I have subsequently spoke with uh, the head of IFPTE for, for <coughs> representing the city, and I think Krista understands uh, better our position than she did when this letter was sent. Okay, thank you. Any, any other trustee questions? Any questions from the public? Did I already ask that? There are none. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Davis. We will proceed now to item 6C, discussion action uh, regarding uh, tier one, tier two contribution rates. Thank you, Chair. That item mm -hmm. uh, I'll present today. Okay. Um, uh, Barbara Heyman, Deputy Director, Office of Retirement Services. Uh, so attached are the contribution resolutions for the Federated Members for Board Approval. Uh, the contribution rates and amounts are taken from the letter provided by Chiron, uh, your actuary, um, and that's in Exhibit A, which was prepared based on the City's email, which is Exhibit B, um, that they will not be pre-funding contributions uh, for the federated plan for the upcoming fiscal year 24-25. Uh, the contribution rates and amounts for the fiscal year 24-25 are based on the June 30th, 2023 actuarial evaluations. Um, the board approved these actuarial evaluations at their December uh, 2023 and January 24 meetings. And this uh, agenda item is seeking approval of those resolutions. Great, thank you. Is there any uh, questions about the contribution rates? None? Uh, hearing none, then would someone care to formulate a motion to accept and approve these contribution rates? I so move. We have a motion from Trustee Abbott. Do we have a second? Second. A second from Trustee Chandra. Any further discussion on the motion? Any public comment? Seeing none, we will vote. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Trustee Avasti, aye. Trustee Chandra, aye. Trustee Faulkner, aye. Trustee Linder. Aye. The chair votes aye. It's approved. Item 6D, uh, action to authorize the secretary to negotiate a second amendment with Cortex Consulting uh, under the agreement not to exceed uh, an amount of $75,000. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair. I'm going to respectfully request that we defer this oh. item, discussion, and action to next month. 
Okay, very well. Any objection to that from any trustees? Seeing none. Go to item 6E, discussion action authorizing the CEO to negotiate and execute a fifth amendment to the agreement with Marty Boyer, communications advantage to extend the term of uh, his agreement to June 30th, 2025. Uh, again, mm -hmm. hey Barbara, I'll take this item. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you said, this memo is requesting approval to negotiate the Fifth Amendment to the agreement with Communication Advantage uh, to extend the term of the agreement through to June 30th, 2025. Uh, no additional budget is being requested at this time. Uh, Ms. Boyer primarily works with ORS on the Retirement Connection newsletter. And uh, per board's policy, the CEO is authorized to enter into a contract up to 50,000 in value over the term of the contract. Um, any uh, contract above that amount does require board approval. And this contract has a contract value of 75,000. Um, so that's why we're coming uh, for board approval. And we're requesting you know, approval for that fifth amendment. Okay, thank you. <coughs> any questions from trustees on this item? And if there are none, would anyone like to formulate a motion to uh, authorize? I so move. We have a motion from Trustee Abbott. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Trustee Linder. Any further uh, discussion on the motion? Any public comment? Seeing none, uh, Vice Chair Jennings, how do you vote? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. I vote aye. It uh, is authorized. On to uh, committee reports, investment committee. Um, I see Chair Chandra, would you like to report? Uh, yeah, we just met last week and uh, much of which we, that we discussed was discussed today. We also got a, a update on the public markets um, from uh, the staff, which was great. Mm -hmm. So nothing really actionable or worthy of report out. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 7.2, the audit committee, uh, uh, co-chair Avasti. Last meeting, uh, there was a lot of discussion on the city auditor report that Council Member uh, Davis mm -hmm. uh, referred to. This is a second report on the compliance of ORS uh, uh, with the city policies and procedures for purchasing and con contracting. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be a presentation on this item. It says presentation and discussion. Or should um, I just summarize? No, presentation was made to the IPA. Okay, so I'll just summarize. Um, mm -hmm. So as per the report, ORS processes were aligned with the city's standard practices in many cases. However, there have been some exceptions. The report noted the instances in which ORS did not competitively procure services, use non-standard payment processes, and retroactively executed contracts. There were a couple of recommendations to improve controls on procurement and contract authority, mm -hmm. and um, some of the recommendations from the city auditor were to uh, uh, draft procedures, um, staff training, avoid, avoid, uh, avoid the wire transfers, and coordinate with the uh, city departments, including the finance department. Management accepted those recommendations, and um, the Joint Audit Committee is uh, expecting uh, status updates on the implementation of those recommendations. Um, apart from that, we also discussed uh, a minor revision in the internal audit auditor charter, um, and the revision is basically to uh, make the internal audit plan as fixed instead of uh, flexible. Uh, there is an update on the status of request to the custodian bank for correction of the plan returns. Mm -hmm. I I'll defer this item to you, Robert, yeah, if you no, want to fine, update the fine. status. Uh, and then also on the yeah, action, yeah. if you can add the uh, the uh, add something to the process of hiring the new internal yes, auditor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Abbasi. So on, on F, we did draft a letter, and uh, we'll, I did share the letter with council, and uh, we're tweaking it before we send it out to both chairs, because the letter that is gonna be going to Bank of New York Mellon is to be signed by both chairs, so the boards and myself. Mm -hmm. So um, the goal is to send it out uh, by the end of this week to both chairs for comments, and hopefully we issue it to Bank of New York by early next week. And the process of hiring a new internet auditor, we already, uh, early this week, we kick off the process from the standpoint that we actually reach out to HR to uh, initiate the process for uh, you know going through the vacancy to fill this position. 
and we will keep you posted as this uh, this process develops. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, what I action? To add one more thing is yep. I think that at the audit committee, um, two people volunteered to provide to help interview um, the final um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. inter auditors, and I was well, one of the, the people, and Dave w Wilson was the other one. Yes. yes. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for the reminder. Uh, I think I blocked that out from the meeting. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies for that. Uh, thank you for the update. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Um, as you, let me just give some background. Um, in the past, this position has specifically um, reported sort of a ministry to the office. Mm -hmm. the, the position always had an uh, open forum uh, to, to deal with and to reach out to both audit committee chairs, but I, I think that avenue was not used as, as expected. And I think the, the, the goal here is that um, we allow, we ask uh, a committee members from both the audit committees to join in the process so they can be part of the selection process and mm -hmm. they can provide input and recommendation on ultimately which uh, auditor to be hired by, mm -hmm. uh, by the office. Right, so to that point, the, as you know, the committees can only make recommendations to the full board which need to be ratified by the full board for it to take effect. The motion that was made at the Joint Audit Committee was to re recommend to the full board the following action. To create an ad hoc committee comprising of Trustee Davis Wil David Wilson on the police and fire side and Trustee Debbie Abbott on the federated side to serve in an advisory role to the CEO and to assist in the evaluation of the final candidates for the internal auditor position until the position is filled, at which point the audit ad hoc committee would dissolve. So that is the motion that's before this board for approval. Thank you, Council. Okay. All right. Uh, well, that it's it's not a motion yet. I guess it's a uh, it's okay. for discussion or recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, do we have such a motion? I can very quickly. So we have have a motion to approve from uh, Trustee Chandra. Do we have a second? Uh, Trustee Abbott seconds. Uh, any further discussion or questions from trustees? Um, I'm just curious, is this the type of position where we turn to a, an outside uh, headhunter, as it were, to, to recruit or? No, this no, is this is, standard, we just do this through the, through the city standard process. Standard yes. hiring process, okay. Uh, if there are any further discussion, any f public comments, seeing none, we can vote to uh, authorize the ad hoc committee. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings? Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Uh, Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. I vote aye. The uh, committee is formed. Uh, Before uh, we move on to the government's communication to interrupt, mm -hmm. we do need to take action on item 72D, which is a very minor one that um, mm -hmm. Trustee Avasti mentioned, which is the removal of the word flexible when describing our audit plans. It's a very minor change. It's found mm -hmm. on page four in red line in the back of materials. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that, uh, holding us to our procedural requirements. Uh, do we have a motion to make that change? I motion to make that change. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Abbott. Do we have a second? second. We have a second from Trustee Chandra. Any discussion, any public comments? Seeing none. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Uh, Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Faulkner? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. I vote aye as well. Are there any other action required under items 7-2? No. No. Okay, move on to 7-3, the Governance Committee. Uh, Chair Linder, is there anything to report? It looks like we haven't met since March. We haven't, and you dealt with the issues that we raised in your March meeting, and you've heard about the discussion with the report that was given to the council and mm -hmm. the feedback on that. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on that, and uh, we have a little bit more work to do. Okay. And our, that right. shows our next meeting is June 20th. Great. Thank you. So sh are we going to pick up all the policies work? So, uh, I'm sorry. So the only policy work that we have remaining is the contract and procurement one, and as well as the travel policy issue with regards to the investment staff, I think, and then also d adopting the city policy on travel for the remaining employees. Those are the only things that are left. Okay. Um, we 
did provide an update to the city council and where we can make that letter available for all the trustees to see but essentially they laid out to the city council that we adopted all of their employment hr related um, policies all the work we did in those matrixes were provided essentially to the city council um, and then we provided additionally suggested uh, policies to fill in rem and remediate a few gaps where ors was not mm. where their policies didn't apply to us mm. Um, so that's that's what we provided, and what the governance policy governance committee would next tackle would likely be the contract and procurement issue that we pick up again. Okay. And we have been working as a joint group between police and fire. A joint, okay. And, and us. Yeah. Okay. Any any other questions from trustees on this item? Okay. I think Mr. Linder, you're still up for the disability committee report. We, we did hear another case mm -hmm. in April, um, and that'll be showing up on the board agenda. It was another denial, and mm -hmm. it'll be showing up uh, in the future agenda. And um, we'll be meeting again in June, June 5th. It just, um, and we do need um, to receive and file the minutes of our mm -hmm. March 5th meeting. Okay. But we are marching right along, as it were. Uh, <laughs> Excellent work. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully, we're cases. working our way through the backlog. Yeah. And uh, that, that's super No, the staff has been super excellent, work. and this will be a, mm -hmm. a breather month in May. Okay. All right, receiving file. Do we need to vote on receiving file, or can that no. be done? No. Chair's yeah, discretion. Chair, do you receive mm -hmm. file if you didn't the mm -hmm. minutes for the incoming? Uh, I, I receive and file those, yes. Okay. Uh, where are we on the clock? Okay. Joint Personnel Committee, um, uh, Co-Chair Chandra, I believe you're Vice Chair. Vice Chair, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, anything going on there at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, boy, well said. I don't know. What, uh, struggling with what I can say. Uh, uh, well, yeah. here's what I'll say procedurally: that mm -hmm. we uh, interviewed uh, several candidates, and uh, we are making it to our next cut, um, and uh, we have a, d a date established for that, um, but. Um, there will be a, a meeting taking place tomorrow that may bear uh, influence on the manner in which we continue the process for the CEO search. Okay, and uh, we have to receive and file those minutes. Uh, education training, uh, I believe. I have a question. Oh, sorry. So I know at one point we thought, and I know this may be up in the air, but mm -hmm. we thought that all of the um, people from both boards would have to come in and be part of the interview mm -hmm. process for the new CEO. Is that still on the table? And do we have sort of a tentative date for that? We do not have a tentative date. That's not a, and that, that is a requirement. We will yeah, have to that do that happen. before yeah. we uh, choose a CEO, a uh, candidate with whom to negotiate a final package. There okay. are no plans yet for that meeting. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, what we've been looking at is some follow-up on the Zoom with some of the candidates. But that's, mm -hmm. as uh, Trustee Chanda indicated, is part of tomorrow's discussion as mm -hmm. well. Okay. And so on. We have a target date, mm -hmm. whether that'll happen or not, we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then when that happens, we need uh, an in, in-person quorum from both right. boards, but the possibility of having remote attendees is, is, is there, yeah. so. But a majority of you guys have to be here. Um, great. Any other questions on the JPC? Okay. Seeing none, I uh, received and filed the minutes. Uh, education and training. We have the Cortex report, uh, Calipers um, uh, Leadership Academy. Is that something for trustees or I don't know what that is uh, coming up in Pasadena? And of course, the SACRS conference in uh, Santa Barbara is coming up next month. Are there any proposed agenda items? Seeing none, we are in adjournment. See you all tomorrow. Go out at home, <laughs> sir. <Huh? laughs>